the panel members here, the moderators are going to do an awesome job of knitting all that has been discussed in the last three days. I know Afolabi agrees with me on this. So let's all look forward to a very wonderful panel. But just to do the honors, I'd like to introduce the moderators for this particular panel. And this panel is going to be discussing church and social. And then, okay, we're going to have two eminent gentlemen serve as moderators. Now, as a form of introduction, permit me to just do this to say that the first name I'd like to introduce is Shegu Olujobi, is the CEO of Vertex in Energy. Prior to Vertex Energy, he worked with the African Capital Alliance and Accenture. He graduated with first class honors in mechanical engineering from the University of Lagos. He's a co founder of the Apostles in the Marketplace, in the marketplace Network. He is also chairman of the Board of Living Spring Schools and the 360 Degrees Foundation, and a board member of the Scripture Grace Foundation. Uh, I'd like to welcome my chairman, Olushegu Olujobi. My chairman, you're welcome, sir. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very you're much, welcome. Obi, but I am not a moderator in this session. I'm an observer, <laughs> just to correct that. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Uh, All right, so I, I think that- we are the main people. Thank you so much, but I, I'm standing Thank by, you. and I yes, obviously sir. have to be around when my all my big pastors are on, and uh, great oh, okay. So I'm standing by, but Femi and Uwa, the main people. Thank you so much. Main people. Okay, so I'm going to Good do that. So I just I recognize him. So thank you for correcting me. My chairman just corrected me. So he is going to be there and watching over us as the elder in the house. Next is straight to you, Femi. Nice to see you. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bavaria. Welcome. Thank you. So Femi graduated with honors from the University of Ife, qualified as a chartered accountant in 1988 and is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. He has extensive experience in a variety of roles in audit and assurance, consulting, credit ratings and research, corporate finance and investment from Akintola Williams and Co, now Deloitte, Pricewaterhouse, now Pricewaterhouse Coopers, Augusto and Co Limited, Nigeria's first credit rating agency, Alliance Consulting and Frontier Capital Limited, a boutique investment banking firm, most recently, he co-founded Frontier Capital Alternative Assets Limited. His profile is amazing. But let's just suffice it to say that from 2012 to 2017, Femi was chairman of Spark West Steel Industries Limited, a pioneer indigenous manufacturer of telecommunication and power transmission towers in West Africa. And then let me just wrap up by saying that he serves as a non-executive director on the boards of Crane Bulk Construction Limited and Chevron Close Pension Fund Administrators Limited, amongst others. Welcome, Femi Edu. Thank you. Thank you. Next, thank you, Femi. Next is Owa Osa Obo. She is the head of corporate development at Capital Alliance Nigeria. Welcome, Owa. You can unmute. Now, Mrs. Owa Osa Obo is the head of corporate development at Capital Alliance Nigeria, a member of the African Capital Alliance NCA Group, an investment management firm with investments in Sub-Saharan Africa. She joined the firm in 2013 and facilitates its strategy definition and implementation, implementation, human resources development and external relations. Owa is personally committed to principles of enduring individual and organizational effectiveness and how to transform these to the larger society. Ladies and gentlemen, what an awesome time we are expecting to have as you moderate the panel on church and social. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, lovely to be, to be here with you this evening to do this. Um, we're a few minutes behind schedule, so I'm going to dive in right away and say that this is the last of the panels and um, what we're, basically going to be looking at is the role of the church and if you like the social dimension in a nation building and national transformation and to do that with us this evening we have an amazing panel of um, four church leaders uh, pastor agu iruku pastor kojoy Yemade, apostle obi pax harry and pastor godman akinlabi I'm going to introduce them in a minute, but before we 
go through the introductions, um, just to say that we're going to be looking at four dimensions of the role of the church, the church and politics, the church and its role in governance and leadership, the church as a role model and respected voice to the nation, and the church and social goods like education and health, family life, and, and we'll try to weave all of this together into, into a coherent narrative. So just before we get started, I'll quickly introduce our speakers. And I'll start in the order of their presentations. Pastor Agu Iruku is senior pastor of Jesus House for All Nations London, a parish of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, established in April 1994. Jesus House, as the church is more commonly known, is acknowledged to be one of the fastest growing black majority churches in England with about 3000 people attending its several services on Sunday. Um, he recently announced his successor to the roles as chairman of the board of trustees and executive council of the Redeemed Christian Church of God in the United Kingdom, regional pastor, chairman of the RCCG UK regional board and special assistant to the General Overseer and member of the World Advisory Council. Um, we're really excited about the new phase he's stepping into, and we look forward to learning more and more about that. And I'll also say that for some time before Pastor Agu moved to the UK, he was my pastor. And um, in 95 and 96, when I spent a significant amount of time in London, he was also my pastor. I attended Jesus House then. So welcome, Pastor Agu. It's lovely to have you this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Our, our next speaker is Pastor Kojo Yemade, a highly regarded teacher of the word of faith who draws out insightful lessons from the word of God applicable to the complexities of everyday life, family, business, and nation building. His messages are transformational, transgenerational, and find relevance across all walks of life. He's been consistently described as a bridge in the Christian community between the older generation of Christian fathers and the younger generation, between entrepreneurs and professionals in business, and between government and the citizens. He's um, a techie pastor, incredibly open to innovation. Um, he's in social media across various platforms with the gospel, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and the church's website, insightsforliving.org. He hosts the programs Insights for Living, the Quantum Leap, and he's also the convener of the platform, which is a nationally recognized annual program. He's happily married to Pastor Tony, who is also a teacher of the word, a filmmaker and content creator. Our next speaker is Pastor Apostle Obi Pax Harry. And um, just before she comes on, who I will be doing her introductions, and um, our final speaker for today is Pastor Godman Akinabi, who will also be introduced just before he comes on. Without, without much ado, I'd like to start the discussions for today. Welcome everyone. And um, dive into the first segment, which is the church and politics. I will be inviting Pastor Agu to help us set the tone for the conversation around the church and politics. And, and I'll start off with a poser and say to you, Pastor, how, how well is the church doing in its role of influencing party politics and setting the tone for the partisan contests that, that we go through in our democracy in, in the quest for, for office, for public office? How well is the church doing in its role in, in setting the tone for partisan politics and the contestation for office, and what should we be doing? Well, firstly, thank you to um, all the organizers, the apostles in the matter, please. Rest of the team for the opportunity to participate in this discussion. Um, if you asked me how well is the church doing, 
with regards to influencing party politics. I hope you wouldn't think I was very stingy with my marks if I said, personally, I would be saying a high of 30% and a low of 20%. So I reckon it will sit somewhere between 20 and 30%. Um, and of course, we know instantly that that's, that's, not, that's nowhere near a pass mark. Um, because you see, the way that the church is designed originally is as a body of reformers. Um, that's what the church is primarily, a body of reformers. And you know, when um, Jesus gives us two powerful metaphors to describe the church, he leaves us in no doubt as to what he expects the church to do. In Matthew's gospel, the fifth chapter from the 13th, two very powerful metaphors that leave you in no doubt as to the role of the church in society, and including in politics. He uses those metaphors of salt and light to describe the church. And you know, without uh, belaboring uh, th that point, we know that both salt and light are change agents and that the church in any society should be a change agent. But what are, what's the challenge with our church in Nigeria? Again, this is me speaking personally. I think the challenge is, is one of purpose. I think our church in Nigeria is a very religious uh, institution. And um, religion doesn't really bring about, certainly not the kind of positive change that we require. Uh, it ticks different boxes um, as opposed to the boxes that we need tick, that to be ticked. What must we do differently to be able to fulfill that mandate of being reformers? I think number one, we must be strategic. Um, it's amazing how every other person is strategic apart from the church. We, we like to live in a religious bubble where we hope somehow in some magical way, things will come to pass without us doing what we're supposed to do. Hence, the church is probably the least strategic of all the many players that are competing for space uh, in any society, and certainly in this area of politics. Uh, the second thing is, if you, if, in, in that scripture that I quoted about salt, salt and light, uh, Jesus makes a phrase. He says, if the salt loses its flavor, uh, but I like the amplified um, expression of that. It says, if the salt loses its strength and quality, it is good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men, which means that it really it has no impact because it has lost its strength and quality. So that's the second thing. If we are going to be influential in any sphere, and especially in this area of politics, we would have to do something about strength and quality. And strength and quality speaks to discipleship and maturity. A lot of Christians, but a lot of carnal Christians. And carnal Christianity is not going to bring the result. It buckles as once it faces a, a, a little pressure. It's adulterated easily. It doesn't have resilience or strength. And we have a proliferation of churches in Nigeria. Everywhere there are churches. If there was so much salt in the broth, then surely we should be feeling the impact of the salt. If there was so much light, then there shouldn't be so much darkness. So it's obvious that there's something wrong with the quality and the strength of the salt and the light. And that really has to do with discipleship and maturity. If we are going to cater to the senses that are usually carnal of people just so we get numbers, then we're never going to really disciple people to be effective in that sphere of politics. The third thing would be to genuinely equip Christians in that area. Um, you've got to give people the tools. You've got to give them the equipment. You've got to prepare them for what is ahead there. I'm sure most of us know many people who are Christians who are wonderful when they are sitting in the church and lifting hands and worshiping. But the moment they get in there, it doesn't take long before they are eaten up by the monsters that are out there and we start to see things and hear things 
that are, that are true as to how they have become totally compromised. And that's simply because they were not equipped. The fourth thing is that we would have to change our mindsets and, and get a kingdom mindset. No time to look at that in detail, but when you look at Romans, the 12th chapter and the second verse, you get an idea of what that involves, where a mindset is changed and a person gets a kingdom mindset. So we go into these spheres or these mountains, if you want to use some of the, the, more, the more common terminology. We go there on a mission. We go there with a mandate. We go there on an assignment. We are sent there to represent the kingdom and we are accountable to a, a king. And the, the, the fifth thing would be um, to work towards a united church. The bane of the church is its lack of unity. Um, said, said all the time, a house divided against itself falls. This house is just not strong because of the division we have against ourselves. You know, Pentecostals don't get on with Baptists. Baptists don't get on with Anglicans. Anglicans can't, don't get on with Catholics. Catholics don't get on with half the others. And the list goes on and on and on. But then even in, amongst Pentecostals, we don't even get on with ourselves. Uh, we are busy competing and striving and territorial. Uh, and, and so it's just not, it doesn't work. So you have pockets of excellence where one or two churches are doing one or two things. But soon we realize that it's, it's like trying to put your fingers in a hole in a dam. Um, and there's just so, there's only so much you can do until we come together. And then the other thing I would like to say, the sixth thing probably I would like to say is that we have to actually get involved. You know, I remember the last elections I asked, I would ask people, are you voting? Half of them were not voting. One quarter of them had left the country and were in England. I saw them in England because they were running away from potential trouble. Now, if you're not even voting, that's the basic form of involvement. How can you truly say that you really want change? Not to talk about getting registered to be a card carrying member of any of the parties, uh, getting involved at the ward level, you know, to start to influence things. So if we're serious, we have to get involved. Um, there are examples of where, where there has been change. Um, if, if, if you remember, in one generation, South Korea was changed. And the industrialization of South Korea was primarily based on the foundation that was laid by the church, where a nation went from 3 or 4% in terms of the number of Christians to almost 40% within one generation, that's phenomenal. And we can look at other examples, the industrial revolution in England that, that, that sparked the, that phase of revival was driven largely by Christians. But let me end on this note because this note is really the dearest and the most important to me. I have no doubts in my mind that the problem the nation faces is a spiritual problem. If we go into politics or any sphere without sorting out the spiritual, and as church folk, we understand that. I don't expect people who are not in the church to understand the spiritual. I don't bother to explain it to them, except they are committed to a negative spiritual. But I know that what is holding Nigeria down is that in that realm where things originate from, there are others who hold the power and they are determined to drive the nation in the wrong way. Part of the role of the church, and Jesus explains that very clearly in Matthew 16 from verse 8, 18, but no time to go into that. Part of the role of the church is in the place of prayer to deal with those ruling powers and authorities so that the work that is being done here can be done. And I end with a story that is one of my favorite Bible stories. It's taken from Exodus, the 17th chapter. It's the battle of Amalek. It's one of the first things I learned when I came into church. I joined church at a time when there was, a, and Femi will understand that, there was a lot of spiritual warfare going on. And I joined church and they were fighting and fighting. And one of the stories I learned was this story about Amalek, amazing story. The children of Israel had these perennial enemies called 
the, the, the tribe of Amalek. They wanted to stop the children of Israel from entering God's promises. Just like we have Amalekites, if you want to call them that. People who are determined to stop Nigeria from becoming what Nigeria should become. And one day they come against the children of Israel. And a strange thing happens. Moses is getting on in years, but understands that this whole thing is really about what I'm about to do. So he gets up and he gives Joshua an instruction. He says, Joshua, choose the best men, the best economists, the best scientists, the, the, the best psychologists, the best marketers, the best businessmen, best entrepreneurs, go into the valley and go and engage the enemy. He says, but I'm going to climb up that hill. And he starts to climb up the hill. Now, people must have wondered, what is wrong with this man? We have a battle here in the valley. Why are you going in the opposite direction? But Aaron and her follow him because the man is getting on in age. And he gets to the top of the hill. And he lifts up his hands with the staff in his hand. Now, that's a perfect symbol of intercession, prayer. And as he starts to pray, Joshua, who's a skilled general, skilled warrior, skilled doctor, skilled economist, skilled scientist, skilled entrepreneur, engages with the enemy in the valley. Now, Aaron and her are puzzled for a while. What's going on here? But then they notice something. They notice that when the old man's hands are lifted up, Joshua is gaining ground. The kingdom is advancing in the valley. The scientists are doing their stuff. Corruption is less. The entrepreneur's uh, ease of doing business really becomes a reality. The doctors are working. Hospitals are working. The laborers are getting paid more than the, more than the, the, the peanuts they are getting paid. The students are in school. The teachers are teaching. They notice that something is happening. And after a while, they make a connection. The Bible says this as I come to an end in verse 11. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. And so that for me settled it. If we don't have Moses's, primarily the church, specifically intercessors in the church who understand how to grapple in that realm, then our schools will fail, our hospitals will collapse, the doctors will go to Saudi Arabia, the economists will be frustrated. The laborers will, will be frustrated and eventually become area boys and, and burn the whole place down. And it will just go despite our best intentions from bad to worse. But if we have the Moseses, if the pastors understand, the, 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 the shepherds understand that it's not about building empires, it's not about competition. It's about people who will go to the place of prayer and give God no rest, then we will see the doctors thrive, we'll see industry grow, and they will be able to apply their minds because the spiritual strongholds have been dealt with. And I feel we will then be able to engage in politics and get beyond the world level because you see the politics of Nigeria is held by a group of people who don't mean well for the nation. And you, you, you can't go forward. We can't go forward until those people are dethroned. And they're going to be dethroned when those on the hill do their work so that those in the valley can do their work. I think um, I've, I've run out of my time. Um, and I, I wanted to stick to time as much as I could. So I hope that in some way um, shed some light. And maybe when we have some questions, we might be able to um, shed a bit more light and I might be able to learn from you and from your question. And um, thank you to Uwan Femi um, for comparing this. I, I think I will hand over to you now. Thank you, Pastor Ago. Thank you. I think you, you've thrown the gauntlet. Actually, I, I was shocked at the candor, <laughs> you know, carnal Christians indeed. And uh, my mind extended to the leadership even of the church, you know, I think we'll go back to that uh, later on. Uh, but in a way, it ties to what our next speaker will be speaking on, and that is um, Apostle Obi Pax Harry. And we've asked her to speak on the church as a role model and a respected voice for the nation. Um, because, I mean, how can the church gain the gravitas, the respect, 
the credibility such that when it passes a message out there, men and women sit up and say, the church has spoken, maybe we should listen. And this is something we must take um, extremely uh, seriously. I'm going to read Apostle Lobby's um, profile very quickly, and then we'll ask her to talk about you know, this issue um, a bit more. Apostle Obi Pax Harry is a well-recognized and respected international apostolic and prophetic voice with a focus on leadership development and capacity building of Christians. She fulfills this call through her role as an apostle, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and pastor. She received her fivefold call through a supernatural encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to her in February, 1993. She has not looked back since then in her passion to see the body of Christ equipped and fulfilling the Great Commission. Her leadership capacity and role has been recognized and affirmed by Christian leadership bodies in Europe, Africa, the Caribbean islands and the USA, where she has ministered extensively. She's a church planter, an author, a mentor, a life coach, strategist, vision developer and leadership development expert. She has mentored in many politics, uh, political scenes, governments, business, media, church leadership, the creative arts, which are all arrowheads molding society. So Apostle Lobby, over to you. How can we get the church to become a role model and a respected voice? You have 10 minutes. I think you're mute. I think you're muted. Yes. Still muted? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to start by thanking apostles uh, in the marketplace um, for organizing this, um, giving us the opportunity as Nigerians to rally around from all over the world to have this necessary, timely conversation about uh, our nation. So um, thank you so very much, everyone. And I want to thank every uh, participator, the panels I was watching and almost forgot that I was one. Pastor John had to help me. And thank you, uh, Phenomenal Femi and um, Femi. My mic is not muted. Femi and um, and um, uh, thank you so very much. Thank you, um, Pastor Agu, uh, my brother. You've spoken another panelists. I want to speak from a place of conviction. Um, it's my country. Uh, I want to speak from a place of conviction. Um, and I, I, I do uh, beg your pardon on Nigerians here. You know, we're very emotional people. Uh, we're very spiritual. And as my eminent brother has said, very religious. So um, sometimes when uh, honesty comes to do with the church, we get all um, emotional and um, uh, we get upset and uh, we vilify. But I think we have a, a great opportunity to do um, 10 things around. We, get a, uh, we have a great opportunity um, to get involved in um, changing things in our nation. So um, the church how do we become a more effective uh, role model? Uh, uh, how do we even become a uh, role model? We're role models, okay? A role model uh, is an entity or a person that uh, people can look to and emulate. So we look at uh, issues happening in Nigeria, be it just what's happened in Lagos State, maybe Lagos State passes a law, uh, EFCC cannot and other agencies cannot um, cannot investigate government officials uh, for corruption in Lagos State. What, what is the church's stand, for instance, in a, um, such a case? We look at um, uh, perhaps the, the Kama law, uh, maybe government wanting to regulate churches and um, we go, uh, we haven't you know, properly maybe read the law. And um, uh, by the way, I come from a legal background. So we get all uh, upset and, um, we haven't really looked at the issues. We get all upset. And like uh, Pasago said, we're not strategic. We get all upset and we haven't kind of looked at it that perhaps this could be an opportunity uh, for us, you know, to uh, become what we're trying to uh, achieve here. 
perhaps this can be an opportunity for us um, to remodel, you know, come into a new wine skin, uh, present something that can give hope and give respectability. So that's another example. So, okay, we have the uh, recent um, crisis with the youth, uh, the NSAs, and we have a, 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 an alleged population of 200 million people, of which until 30% perhaps are under 35. So this is a large, you know, population. These are, are children that are, you know, a generation that is crying out for just this a, a generation that is obviously uh, born for that and how do we guide this generation in such a way that uh, they have hope and we are then looked at as an agent of social change so this is really uh, the the issue that we are uh, spe uh, speaking about here so as uh, someone who also I could even qualify as that as someone who uh, from England um, um, sent to Nigeria. I didn't actually engage with Nigeria as a minister. I came into Nigeria as a, a businesswoman, five, uh, five years working uh, with a, a NEPAR uh, representing uh, the two uh, companies that actually um, um, set up the, uh, the national framework for power energy in Nigeria from the time of independence. So for five years, I worked in that sector and was um, able to uh, connect with the Department of Employment because of what I saw there. I'm talking about values right now, you know, also um, how I then came out as a minister because I, I felt that there was a need, you know, for, um, uh, as a minister, as a church, there was a need to emerge, to become uh, a, a voice and a vehicle, you know, uh, uh, that, that could stand as like Agu said, salt and light, that there was a need to stand out, you know, to begin to deal with systemic um, um, corruption, systemic issues in the system, you know. So um, I, like I said, I engaged with the our sector and the, the the what was going on there was just unbelievable and you will be surprised mostly by Christians and you know very religious people so that that really was alarming for me so I have been part of like I said I want to speak from a place of conviction and we are saying how can the church be an effective uh, role model in a society as we can say as at you know April 2021 is is uh, is in decline is is facing day by day, you know, news of, you know, uh, uh, decline of, of, you know, we're almost in a, in a, uh, experiencing a, a, <laughs> a systemic collapse of our value system. You know, we are really in a crisis uh, situation and we have the largest uh, Christian population, 48% apparently of 80, uh, 80 million Ni uh, Nigerians, 80 million Nigerians are Christians, you know, and um, according to uh, 2011 Pew, and, and how do we become uh, more effective in stewarding? Now, uh, another thing I want to add to this, please, I want to add to this, that we, we, the church, who is the church? We have to ask who is the church everyone's talking about the church but what this whole um convergence is about is um we get the opportunity to have the conversation and we ask who's the church jesus didn't say he was going to uh, build a, a uh, jesus said he would build the church so in, in when he said he was going to build the church uh, the word church there my fellow pastors know here, he, he didn't say he was going to build a building. He, he was talking about a, a people. He was going to build a, a people. He was going to build people. Um, let me just for time's sake, just, you know, put it in a, a context that will help us uh, with what we're talking about. He was going to build a people that are insightful, uh, people that are, are going to operate uh, structures and systems uh, that can you know, uh, deal with societal issues. So intelligent people, people that can 
imitate the pastor, uh, the, 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 their master. So that's uh, disciples, you know, because a disciple is an imitator of the master. So Jesus being a role model, uh, we are supposed to look at him as a role model. What did he do? He was not in a building. He was out in society dealing with societal issues. So I've named about three, three different issues, three different, um, uh, three things that, uh, that have recently occurred in Nigeria that I feel that the church ought to have a distinct voice, that there ought to uh, uh, be a concise uh, op opinion, if I want to use, I'm being very careful, like I said, we're emotional people, there ought to be uh, 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 a directive from the church, the uh, church ought to give to us a, a, a marching order that uh, the church ought to give us uh, a concise uh, uh, direction of which way uh, 80 million people should be uh, going. Well, I, I, I think that there is hope out there. Uh, several things have been me mentioned. I think that one of the ways that the key way that we can become a more effective um, uh, role model is you know, to get back to what it is all about, get back to de definitions, what is a church? Okay, we look at our greatest wealth as a nation, human capital, we we'll go back to what uh, our role model did, he took 12. So instead of building empires, as we've been told, we get back to equipping, that's what it was uh, all about. So we go back to give people development. Like I said, I came as a business person, I went into, um, 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 capacity building. I went back into uh, mentoring because I saw that there was a gap there. So that's one of the key ways that we can um, become a real model. We can recover our effectiveness, which is our saltiness, and we can be light. So we go back to what the entity was, you know, set up to do, what the Jesus set up, what he said he would build. He said he would build this thing and not that the people would build it, he would build the people. So Nigeria's greatest wealth is her people. So we go back to developing, so, you know, be uh, mindful, strategic about capacity building. And then in doing that, we also have to be um, strategic that uh, we really haven't, church leaders have to understand that there is something called expertise. Every Everybody doesn't have to have a Christian school. Everybody doesn't have to have an equipping center. So we have to understand that there are specialties. Nigerians are some of the brightest people. We're developing people all over the world. I was lecturing, in, uh, well, I was invited to lecture at Wagner University only on Monday. My book was, um, you know, uh, was accepted as a, as a reading uh, textbook on their master's um, uh, program, surprisingly. And, you know, so Nigerians, and I was able to, um, to challenge a paradigm. So we as Nigerians, you know, are doing things we can challenge, we can't, you know, we, we have to understand, you know, that, you know, we, we, we have what it takes okay, you know, to change our nation. So to do this, the church has to accept that she is, and whatever the church is, because I'm trying to say the church is you, the church is I. So the church is in the building. So we have key church leaders here. So they have to come into this convergence. After this, we have to have some conversations. We have to come into a place of agreement where we decide that, you know, you are the church. We have to give back the voice to the people who can, you know, give uh, intelligent representation. We have to go back to what the Bible rep, um, states, you know, there have to be generational transfer. So Africa is the only place where you don't have succession planning, you don't have generational transfer, our culture, religion, these are some of the greatest hindrances that we have had, you know, for the church's de um, uh, development. Revelation is progressive, so we have to um, we have to come into that place of modernity where a generation comes up and they are able to help, you know, uh, us move forward. So we have to go back to equipping. We have to be an equipping church. We have to be people that train people for the specific spheres. So we talk about the seven mountain. Um, uh, 
for instance, mandate. So I was able to challenge that at Wagner University as a Nigerian, because we have to bring those into the Nigerian context. So we have to, we have to equip the people that will build Nigeria for Nigeria, all right? So we have to go back into equipping. We have to become a people who connect with, for instance, National Assembly. We have to check the laws that are being passed. It's not okay that we become a people that pray after laws have been passed. So we have to develop people, advocate for advocacy. We have to be really strategic, work with all the other parts of uh, uh, government governance and know what is happening. We can't be a reactionary people uh, as a church. We have to be participators. We have to be people that are daily engaged with what is happening. We cannot allow culture to cause us to lose our voices. We, we also have to be mindful of the gender thing. We cannot be a, a, a church that is you know, male dominated and, and women don't have a voice. So I, I um, overall, I just wanna say to us to, to, to become an effective voice, to regain our effectiveness, we have to submit ourselves to also, um, we have to become more accountable. It, 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 it hinges on accountability. You have to present yourself uh, as, you have to be what you preach. So for instance, it's okay to be regulated in certain areas. It's all right. So I wanna leave it there till we, till we ask the questions. And then, uh, yeah, so we have, to, we have to work with what we have and we have to be prepared to be role models. And to be role models, we have to be what we preach. People Thank have you. to be able to have trust in us as yeah. people, you know, who can who can lead the 80 million to the promised land. Yeah. Thank you, Apostle Obi. Um, you've said quite a bit, and I think the, the message I get from you is that there's so much potential, you know, there's so much potential. But that church that Christ talked about does need to be built, you know, and, and the challenge will, will be that so that we can indeed lead people uh, to the promised land. I'm going to go on to the third uh, of our speakers, um, our very distinguished pastor, Godman Akilabi. And I'm going to read his profile. I may not read everything, but I'll try and touch on the major highlights of it. And then I will, you know, introduce, you know, what Pastor Godman will be talking about. He is a lead pastor of the Elevation Church, uh, Lagos, Nigeria, where he has a God-given mandate to make greatness come on. Prior to the Elevation Church, he served as associate pastor in Daystar Christian, Cent uh, Christian Center and continues to serve as a faculty member in the Leadership Academy of Daystar. He holds a bachelor's degree in mining and engineering a master's in international law and diplomacy, and an MBA. He's a seasoned and sought after teacher, trainer, relationship coach, and a public speaker whose ministry has blessed many all over the world. Pastor Godman, I think most people know you, so I wouldn't read the other two paragraphs um, on, on your profile. I'd like to go to the um, theme around the church and social goods. Um, the church is an institution. And in an environment where people see the church thriving materially, uh, you know, um, I, I, I think it was one of these dragons, you know, pitch programs where a young man went to pitch about setting up a church as a business and he wanted venture capitalists to invest in it. You know, as though the church had now become, in, become a money-making, you know, enterprise, uh, you know. And, and, and so they see all of this wealth around pastors, around people, but the people are living in abject poverty in Nigeria. And the question is, mm. what role is the church playing to ameliorate the suffering of even its members, not just the masses? So what role can the church play in providing the necessary social goods? Um, the government may catch up eventually, but the church certainly can take a lead in this regard. So how, first of all, maybe how well do you think we've done? Maybe I've been too harsh in my <laughs> criticism and um, how much better can we do? Thank you, 10 minutes. 
Thank you, uh, Sisawa, and thank you, everyone. Uh, I come with a, a great privilege to be a part of this panel, and I've enjoyed myself having been on here for maybe about two hours or so now. Great minds and you know, great thoughts and ideologies. All right, and uh, to my co-panelists, Apostle Hobby, Pastor Agu, thank you for the great thoughts that you've shared. Uh, if you talk about rating the church as far as um, uh, social goods, uh, uh, I mean, as, as far as, you know, looking at that, I would say, just like Pastor Agu said, if I can just, you know, follow on with him on, on that, um, on the political side, it's still the same thing. You will say, uh, especially in the last, maybe like 20, 30 years, if we just focus on the church in Nigeria, the last few decades, maybe I would say 30% or there about 35%. And um, I'm saying that because we can't really say that the church hasn't done anything. Uh, the church has done yeah. quite a bit. Uh, but you know, uh, these are perilous times, <laughs> like the scripture puts it. Uh, it's like the, the darkness is getting stronger. And it, it, it then makes a nonsense of what you are doing, especially when it's not as strategic as it should be. Uh, it won't make the right kind of impact that it should make. And that, that's why we're where we are. And then when you're less strategic, you are heading and abetting the darkness. Uh, so it, 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 it becomes even, you know, rather than uh, dealing with root issues, a lot of the times we cut leaves. And when we're cutting leaves, then what, what you see is that um, the effect of what we're doing uh, will, will, I mean, will not be so pronounced or it, it, what we're doing will not be effective. So the church has done a, a, a bit. There's a lot more to do. A lot more. Uh, currently, the station is in a, you know, is in a state that it's it, it's not. I mean, we all know what's going on in our nation, and somehow, one way or the other, uh, when the church was supposed to speak out and we didn't speak out, when we we're supposed to model the salt and the light uh, that Pastor Agu spoke about, and we didn't do that, one way or the other, we contributed to this. Let me say this quickly. One of, I mean, as a as a as a preacher. Uh, one, one of my favorite Martin Luther King Jr. quote uh, is this one that I want to, uh, I just want to quickly run through. It says, uh, any religion that professes to be concerned about the soul of men and is not concerned about the slums that damn them, the economic conditions that strangle them and the social conditions that cripple them is a spiritually moribund religion a waiting barrier. Uh, I found that very interesting and it has guided my approach uh, to, to social work as, as a preacher and, and as a church as well. Uh, so I see that there's a lot when we talk about the different sectors, especially the places where the church can make uh, great contributions like the educational sector, the health sector, uh, the family and all that, that there's a lot more that we can do uh, everything in Nigeria has been geared towards, you know, everything going through degradation. Uh, the the uh, uh, educational sector uh, just went, started going down in the last 30 years, and then it became more rapid, uh, maybe in the, in, in, the, uh, in the year 2000 and up till now, the last 20, 21 years. Uh, so public schools and, and nothing to reckon with. Uh, a lot of us can't go back really to the, the schools that we, we I mean, we, we participate in uh, alumni stuff, but the real uh, uh, things that they need, the, the capital project, the, 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 the train of teachers, you know, all those things. And, you know, these are things that are creating real opportunities for the light of God in the churches to shine brighter. Uh, many of uh, these areas where the church is supposed to shine a light are now becoming uh, like a private sector led, uh, 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 you know, part of our economy, like uh, the education, for instance, everybody's going to private schools and people are shifting abroad. And some churches have started universities, started, you know, uh, high schools and all that. And that's why we can say, okay, maybe something is really happening. But when it comes to real, you know the the reorientation that we that that the 
Nigerians need. That's where the church really needs to play uh, a stronger role. It's not just about the church itself doing a lot. It's about how we move, how we change the mindset of our people. Uh, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, was it last, not, not, not today, last Sunday, I was teaching in church and I was talking about the importance of medical science. Uh, that when we pray for people in church, they get healed. But that I consider that as retail healing. So two people there, ten people there, five people there. What about solving the the health problem of a nation? And God has given the church the wisdom and the power to be able to do that. So I ask a simple question: How many people here, first and foremost, are in the academia? This is a first service, seven a.m. service. Maybe about five hundred people or so in that service, and only two people. How many people here engage in anything that has to do with research of any kind, not only in the SX or educational sector, of any kind? Maybe about 15 people out of 500. And I was like, look, so wh what are you all doing? <laughs> because if we really want to take our place as a church, uh, we, we have to be that strategic. We have to uh, be able to engage in areas that are not necessarily glamorous, but pretend serious solution that can give serious solution to the issues that plague a nation or a people. And, and th that, that, that's where I see that we need to do a lot more. But in, practically speaking, I'll say we need to get out there as the church where uh, the people are, whether on, in Lagos where I live, whether on the island or the mainland, everywhere you go, you have slums. I live in Lekki area here. We have like four or five slums just all around us, you know, uh, from Jakonde to Aro Town to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Oniru side. You have all kinds of slums. When you go further down, I got all kinds of slums. Things happen in those places. We need, as the church, to get into those places and look for the, the you know, uh, many more things. You know, Nigeria, we talk about proliferation of churches. Uh, so a lot of churches are not so big. They don't have the capacity to do big infrastructural stuff. But let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, last year or two years ago, just before the pandemic uh, in 2019, uh, we have a campus of our church in Maryland in Kenya. And they went into some of the schools on Bank Anthony, uh, Mobility Bank Anthony way, and uh, maybe like two or three high schools there. And they, they, there's a group in church that said, look, we want to, to help the final year students who are preparing for NECO and WAEC for a period of about three months to teach them maths and English and some of the sciences. And we'll take past questions with them as big brothers. So just say like big brothers of the Elevation Church, we came to help you. I have a proof. I'm not saying something that didn't happen. The result in that school, the NECO result for the, the number of students that had um, credit, at least minimum of a credit in English, math, and the sciences they taught them improved by 25% by that singular effort compared to the year before. So there are, uh, uh, I can go on and on about simple ways by which the church can shine a light brighter when it comes to you know, the, 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 uh, the social life of people. Because if we over, they, they, like uh, someone has said before, the church is essentially over religious, you know, just focusing only on religion and all that. But the real leadership, the real leadership that we're supposed to model to, to the nation and to the people that will give us a voice are the things that we're running away from. Um, uh, when, when we talk about the area of health, for instance, there are many churches who have the capacity to start primary health centers, or if we can't do that, uh, there's something that we have also modeled, which is uh, there are people who earn less than 30,000 Naira a month. They do all these jobs where they can't have access to health insurance. There are health insurance companies that are willing with a little amount of money to put those kind of people on some kind of health insurance. And the churches, I mean, we, we, are, we are piloting that, just looking at it. The churches that will just gather people and say, look, we want to give you health insurance. 
so you can have access to primary health care, you know. And there are many other things like that that don't even have to, you know, I mean, that will not involve a lot of resources. It's just been strategic in a place like Nigeria where the church and religious institutions must pay attention to. We must look at what is going on there and think through how we can participate. Human capital development uh, is also, because it talks about light, shining our light and light is, is, is the you know, enlightenment of the soul. So we're supposed to be the feeder organizations to uh, institutions like what uh, Mohabudu was talking about the other time, uh, creative uh, institutions where they're training people. The church is supposed to be a place where we can discover those talents that we also push to those people. Uh, a lot of people sing in church every Sunday in the choir and in different places that, 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 that we, we have to take it beyond them just singing to worship God to also discovering who they are and how they can live a life of contribution. In all the places where we call the seven mountains of Saita influence, uh, the church should aid people to discover who they are and move into the fullness of you know, how they can be sought and light indeed. Um, uh, le let me just add one or two things to, you know, to, to what I've said already. Um, I, I believe that the enablers and the, the catalyst to the church being able to do a lot more uh, will be collaboration, unity, and I think Pastor Agu spoke to that a bit, a collaboration, unity, uh, becoming more kingdom focused, and then empowering the younger generation uh, so that they, 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 they can get platforms and be more projected. Uh, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, if, if, if I, I mean, if you are God and you want, you're looking for people that you can use and you have plans of what you want to do between now and the next 50 years, who will you reveal those things to and expect to run with them? It's not people that, you know, that are retiring in, you know, 10 to 20 years. It's people that still have maybe like 40, 50 years ahead of them. So that's why the Bible says your young men shall see vision, you know, and, and all that. But uh, when they don't have platform of, of expression, especially even through a church where they worship, it leads to frustration. So, um, uh, and like I said, there's a need for a lot of collaboration for that to be able to happen. I'll say that the, the issues that we have in our nation, around our nation, even in the North, in the Southeast, in the Southwest, everywhere, uh, they all create the opportunity for the Church of God in Nigeria to shine a light brighter. You said something, uh, Sister Wa, about the fact that uh, the church fronts uh, 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 affluence and you know, just rub it on people's face. That's the culture that has to change. Uh, and it's because before now, the church has only focused so much, like we say, on the gospel of salvation, not the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of transformation. Because it's when you focus on the gospel of transformation that the church gets interested in leadership, in policy, in, you know, in being strategic, because we have to build institutions so that the things that we're struggling with now, we won't have to struggle with that again. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, uh, there's this favorite thought on my mind, how one day we will have um, a student loan scheme in Nigeria so that any student at all, anybody at all that wants to go to college or university will be able to go. I know there are many things that will enable and facilitate that, but the church ideally uh, should be the one moving for anything at all that will improve the state of people. And that's the only way we can regain our voice. So- Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I, I, I would, uh, maybe I should, I should stop here for, for Q&A. Thank you. Uh, I, Thank I, you I, so I much. I've been able to make a little contribution. You have, I mean, clearly the harvest is plenty. <laughs> is the laborer that needs to work harder. I, I think that's that's what we take from you. 
Um, Femi will introduce uh, the next question. Um, I understand Pastor Poju is not here, but Femi will take that over. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Uwa. And um, I'd like to say thank you to Pastor Agu, Apostle Lobby, and Pastor Godman for your your opening statements. Um, very insightful. It uh, provoked a lot of comments um, online in, in the chat. And um, we're, we're going to move into the, into the Q&A session. Um, I, I'd like to apologize on behalf of AIMP. Uh, Pastor Kodjo, unfortunately, is not with us. Um, he has not joined us as yet. So we will be moving into the Q&A session. Um, and that will be moderated by Uwa. But I'd like to sort of cheat and sneak my first question in. And I'm directing this to Pastor Agu. Um, having spoken about, about the church and the need for us to be strategic in, in our engagement, what must we do to be just more intentional about developing leaders? What are the specific things that the church can do to mobilize and, and train and also deploy you know, leaders into government, but also into leadership in all of those mountains um, that are our national life? Yeah, um, I, I think we've touched on, on most of it. I think uh, the first thing is an understanding that it has to be done. Because if it is not done, then this nation has gone down the drain. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing I feel is absolutely necessary is a burden. And I think that could actually form a prayer point for us, that people should genuinely have a burden because a lot of people don't have a burden yet. There's this notion that I can somehow create my own paradise mm -hmm. in the midst of this chaos. Well, mm -hmm. we need to realize that the chaos is eventually going to come to your front door and over your fence, no matter how high and mm -hmm. no matter how many electric wires you have, into your room, it, that is where the chaos is going to come if we don't get a burden to change it. The third thing would be for us to uh, uh, sit down and devise the ways to do that, the, the education that is needed, the uh, teachings that are needed, the methods that are needed to start to equip these people. And the fourth thing would be to, to start to find a pipeline so that we equip people and we can encourage them, support them as they go into any of these mountains and support them whilst they are in the mountains, whilst they are on those mountains taking territory for us. Um, I think those are the things. Um, 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 Godman, Pastor Godman spoke about collaboration. That is absolutely critical because this um, um, idea of each man trying to do his own it has failed us. We have reached the end of the limit. There's only so much you can do. How many thousand people can you have inside your church? Even the biggest churches have a hundred thousand are here. I mean, some churches might have that many. What is a hundred thousand out of uh, 200 million people? So it's time for us to start to collaborate with each other. I bring my strength. Uh, Godman brings his strength, but you bring his strength. Uh, you know, the others bring their strengths and together, we can make a difference. Um, and I'm, I'm praying that's the next season that we're entering uh, as a church. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Femi, do you want to go on? Femi, you're, on, you're on muted. Okay. Um, my, my, my next question, um, um, would be one that has come from uh, someone in the, in the audience. And it says, how do we separate modeling and herding within the church? On occasions where churches have taken a stand, particularly in politics, it has resulted in debate about the church overstepping its place. Where, where is the balance between church as a a nonpartisan voice 
and church intervening to make statements in, in the polity. It, the, Again, this one is for you, Pastor Abu. Okay. Um, well, I think firstly that the, 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 the leadership of the church, I don't feel that we should be partisan in an open way. I feel that we must appreciate that the entire political spectrum is represented in our church. And um, it's an unnecessary pressure for us to be partisan in, a, in an open way politically. However, I feel that we, we have a place to deal with issues. So for us in the United Kingdom, for example, now we're dealing with the issue of race um, and racism. It's not, a, it's not a party political thing for us. It's a societal problem that we are dealing with. I feel that, um, that that's the role that we have to play. I might have my partisan political interests, but those are private. I don't get on a pulpit and say, go and vote PDP or go and vote APC or go and vote whatever party. I, do, I don't feel that we, should, we have a right to say that. Um, I feel that we can equip people. That's what we should do. Um, help them be discerning. In fact, bring in the participants to come and sit down in some sort of hostings and tell the people what you're going to do. Um, equip the people to be discerning and let the people as they're led by the spirit. Now, however, you must accept that if you take a stand on some social issues, you will get attacked uh, because some of those issues cross into politics. That's par for the course. It's an occupational hazard. As long as your focus are the social issues and you're not using that to say vote for this party or vote for that party. I think the bane of our church in Nigeria is that we are so partisan politically. It's unreal. I mean, come politics, the church divides clearly into PDP church and APC church, which is a bit of a disaster. Um, rather than being the kingdom of God that is that, you know, driving the kingdom of God. Because when you become partisan, it doesn't matter if the person is incompetent because the person is in this party, which is your party, the person is good to go. Um, but you want to not be partisan. And frankly, you want to actually start to be prophetic, which is, you know, start to discern the voice of God, the mind of God for the situation, so that you're not speaking in a partisan way but you're speaking prophetically when you do speak. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Agu. So, Ua, um, over to you. Okay, I think we have a few questions here, and I'm just going to kind of pass them around um, our, our panel. One here says, what organization in Nigeria should drive strategy? Is it CAN or the Pentecostal representative body? I think it's PFN, if I'm, if I'm correct. I'd like um, Apostle Obi to handle that because you were the one talking about the church as a corporate. So what do you think? Um, quite honestly, in my uh, opinion, I think um, strategy is not best um, driven in uh, those kinds of, uh, by those kinds of religious um, uh, settings. It would be um, organizations, kingdom organizations. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, organizations like kind of AIMP, and you have to actually deliberately be intentional by selecting um, strategists. Those are that that can do that kind of work, and it's not an either or. But we're talking about collaboration, and then you know they can collaborate with uh, organizations like CAN and uh, PFN. So such established organizations uh, have to be willing also to pivot to uh, to um, collaborate with, you know, generations that are, are coming up and also um, invite and welcome its, you know, assets, recognize that times are changing, be willing to, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about the, the, like the, the role of the diaspora, welcome what it has. Yeah, you just, that, I don't if, I, think if I could, if I could jump in quickly, uh, are you saying that as currently constituted, yeah. those organizations can drive the change. It isn't that they are set up is unable to. You're, you're talking no, about the I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that as they are, mm -hmm. the, the, those organizations, as they are set up, I don't think that they are set up for strategy, but there are people within those organizations that can be part of 
strategic groups, but that there are others outside. It's going to be fluid. You know what, what, what's like, like Pastor Agu talked about burdens. It's going to be people, you know, out there, like we're gathered here. There are people that are strategists, that are strategically minded, that are gifted in that way. They're all over. We're Nigerians doing this. You know, they, we, they have to be open to welcome them. Like AIMP, when you know seeking for people who are participating here, so can and um, uh, PFN such organizations are set up for what they're set up. It's really complex. Um, so perhaps we 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 shouldn't put so much on them. It's really complex, but we can collaborate with them, and um, they'll be willing to um, you know welcome you know yeah. We can partner with them, collaborate with them, but to expect that such organizations will uh, drive strategic uh, distilling of, you know, uh, what you need, plans, road plans, maybe a 20 year uh, plan to uh, shift the political sphere. I don't think, um, well, I'm being as optimistic as I can be mm -hmm. and being careful as well. I don't really think so. Um, and then like we talk about kingdom versus church, you know, there's a lot to distill. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I have you. to be honest. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, let me see if we have any other question. He says, how do we strategically help the traumatic unengaged people um, within the church, particularly the Northern Nigerian church? So somebody from Sokoto is sending this question to say, we have a church here that is traumatized. You in the South, things appear to be very comfy, uh, but we are holding on. We are holding our turf. Um, how can you help us? Can any of our panelists take that on? I'd uh, like Pastor Godman or Agu, Pastor Agu to take it. Please. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. I'll say that um, the church is one and we should continue to strive to be one. Um, the, the church in Northern Nigeria uh, may be in a different geographical entity with a different set of issues, but it's still part of the church in Nigeria. I think where things have failed a bit, uh, still what uh, uh, Apostle Obi was talking about, the bodies that are supposed to bring all of us together, they don't have uh, the, 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 the mechanism to get that done the way it's supposed to be done. And uh, uh, the, the, the lack of unity is still affecting those bodies and everybody's watching their own thought and just wanting to be relevant uh, because I don't see any reason why the church in the South can't put funds together, put uh, you know things together that will make uh, the, 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 the church in the, in the North that is hurting and has been traumatized uh, to, to nurse such churches uh, to, to full health. Uh, but you know, that point of collaboration and how that is going to be, you know, what is going to foster that? Because it's happening right now, maybe because some churches write directly uh, to some of us in the South, or we have relationship with the leaders of those churches. I know about churches that were burned down and all that, or through the Boko Haram time, and the ones we can support, we, we supported them. But there could be a better, more, you know, well-organized way of doing that because a lot of those churches are non-denominational. So the ones within the denomination, the denominations have a bigger body, bigger post, they will help them. But the other churches that are there that are not part of any denomination, we need some system to be able to, you know, work out how to help them. And that's what is not uh, what is not available right now. Thank you, Pastor. Oh, um, may I like add to... something, Owa, oh, please? Yes, may please. I add something? You will be amazed the effort that a, a lot of Christian ministries are, are, are making, like uh, Pastor Goodman said, the church is one, especially in the North. But the thing is, uh, there is no connection. So we talk about the media mountain. We really need help. You know, I don't know how this can be that uh, uh, information is, you know, galvanized and people know what, or there is such independent spirit and so much effort, so much uh, energy, you know, dissipated, currencies wasted. You know, we need bridges. We really need burden bearers. Oh like uh, Pastor Agu said, how do we get everybody informed? You're, you're in Lagos, you don't know what's happening in Kaduna or, or and there's so many people praying, praying. I believe in prayer, but prayer doesn't solve all the problems. So how do we get 
you know, all these different uh, efforts, you know, galvanize. There's so much going on in um, um, the church, you know, so many groups helping Christians out in the North, uh, in the IDPs and all, but people don't know what one another because I'm involved in a lot of uh, leadership groups in Northern uh, Nigeria you know, credible groups. But that's what I'm saying. That's how, that's part of how we regain our effectiveness as role models. People don't know what we're doing. So how are they going to uh, believe in you when they don't know what you're doing? And you're making a lot of efforts. So we have to become an intelligent, you know, we have to become an effect. I mean, pursuing effectiveness, we have to become accountable, we have to become organized, we have to understand how to, you know, document, we have to really become uh, a, a people who are pursuing, we have to develop a roadmap, you know, of how we're going to come out of the rut, and we Thank have, you. yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, Apostle Lobby. The next question will go to Pastor Agu. Um, and I'll overlay this somewhat. He says, how can Nigerian Christians in diaspora engage from the strategic level? I don't agree that the older Christians with a few years to retirement have nothing to give. If God could use Moses effectively at 80 years, then there's hope for a person in their 60s. And let me now tie this and why I directed this uh, to you. Um, in a reality, I mean, we're talking about impacting governance. And I ask myself, how about governance within the church itself? You know, transparent structures that say, you know what, this is not about me or my family. This is about God's work that outlives me and is for society. Now, a, a, a church that carries that view and that vision and that burden, which is strategic, um, what models do we have to learn from of how a church can be positioned in, in that way? Um, that its governance is so transparent that that church then speaks to the public and the public say, well, because you are speaking from that church, we will listen to you. I mean, I, you know, how can you help the thinking or the discussion in that line? Well, I mean, fortunately, we have a few examples. Um, and we're grateful. I mean, Godman is on the line. I'm not, I'm not flattering him. But um, that I know is a church. Fortunately, we have a few examples. It's a big cultural shift that needs to take place. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's really dealing with an entrenched culture, mm -hmm. both an entrenched religious culture um, and an entrenched culture in itself. Um, I, I feel that the churches will have no choice but to change because the next generation is not going to accept that smoke screen um, and are not going to accept religious platitudes that say you can't ask the man of God any questions or anything like that. The next generation is not going to accept it. And if we're going to reach them, then that change has to come. I think the churches that will be attractive to the next generation that will pioneer that kind of accountability and transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're beginning to see some of them um, some of the older ways of doing things will start to be very challenged uh, next so many years because people are not going to accept that. It doesn't work. Um, an older generation can accept it, but a younger generation, they are simply not going to accept it. Obvious. They are going to demand it, that transparency and accountability. Um, and especially you start to see it in the, in the urban areas first. Because in the more rural areas, there's more room to use culture and manipulation and intimidation and religion. And, you know, the poverty there and the literacy there allows that to happen. But in the more ur urban areas, you're going to start to see a younger generation demanding some degree of um, accountability and transparency and going to where they find it. <laughs> true. Very true incentives i mean you know people want to worship where they will have trust and you're right you know if they don't trust they won't come i have another question here for uh, apostle obi says how can women drive this societal change in an african context which is not always as progressive um, of its view in terms of its view of women uh, you are a woman uh, 
and obviously, you know, you have you're probably at the zenith, one of the most most successful, uh, you know, females in uh, you know the evangelical uh, field, and that's why you're speaking to us today. So, what are personal experiences in terms of grappling with this paradigm of how society sees women? Um, talk less of women in uh, leadership roles um, in the church. Well, thank you for that important question. I was speaking um, at an apostolic center in Germany, and I was really extolling from the depth of my heart, the Nigerian um, uh, Christian leaders. And this is the truth. This is my experience um, and all my years in the UK as well. And that leads me to the conclusion uh, that uh, as a woman, uh, if you do not even think about marginalization and focus on uh, self-development and focus on doing the right things, I don't think that you're going to face, um, or maybe because I'm an, uh, an unrepentant optimist, I believe in, you know, um, developing myself. I don't believe in being given uh, token honors. I believe in uh, anything that I get being earned. So that, that's my own personal non-negotiable. And I would want to encourage women to begin to um, uh, think that way. So I have never, I've been received by the Nigerian male church leadership in my gifting and not as a woman, you know, because it's service, you know, that's what it is. Even being called apostle only, that's not a title, it's a function. And it's important that we understand that, that the role of an apostle is to build people. So then we hold you accountable. So if oh, we're talking about oh. these different uh, titles are the government of God. So we understand that what a, pa a pastor does is to maintain you like a car. You see, so that's a maintenance gift. And that's why the whole, uh, everybody's asking, what are we gonna do next? Because uh, pastors are, are, are not going to tell you what you're gonna do next. That function, it, that gas is not given to tell you what you're gonna do next. It's not given to build you up. It's the, the apostle prophet gift is what's given to build. And when they build, then the a pastor, uh, a grace makes things go. So I, I want to say to any woman, concentrate on, on just self-development. I have never, I've not faced those issues. And, and so I, I can't really say to you, and this is why I'm very, very passionate about uh, 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 working with women and saying to women, it, it's not okay just to put yourself, I think the greatest abusers of women are women. And I don't think women mm -hmm. spend their time, you know, propagating those messages about singing to your husband and all of that stuff. I think we should encourage women, you know, to develop, you know, if you study the Bible, it's one of the greatest books on philosophy. We, we should, I mean, we should be teaching women to create wealth. We know what all these, you know, local things and all these different things, they are paradigms that if we develop, we can, we can export these things, okay? So we have things being imported into us, paradigms that the people that write about them in the Western world have never even built them. You see what I mean? In our chaos, we can we can uh, apply. We can we can you know this. We can build models, prototypes. We can resolve the issues that the Western world have as well. So we have to own our stories. We have to you know build you know our nation. And in building our nation, we have what it takes. Okay, to 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 offer to the Western world their own problems. So I don't have. I don't want to be given uh, a token. Uh, 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 prizes as a woman, you know, I want to end. So <laughs> I, I, I celebrate the Nigerian uh, men and because uh, I, uh, I haven't, I don't know. So please, if you're a woman out there, uh, just uh, get yourself, uh, you know, discover yourself, you know, who you are, believe in who you are. Don't be, you know, fine just being, you know, the assistant bishop, the bishop, you know, mommy, bag, all of this stuff, people, you know, you know, you, you, you really, you know what, you have, you have, you know, what it takes, you have, you have to contribute to the national conversation. You know, Thank women you. are the best that any nation has. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, Pastor Lobi. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I think um, a question, and this goes to um, Pastor Gottman, and um, this is about skill, you know. Um, you talked about some of the efforts your church was making. And as I was thinking about it, I said, it, you know, it's all great to have, you know, this elevation, big brothers and all of that. But when I think of missionaries that made an impact and mission schools, you know, that were set up all over the world, the word that comes to mind is quality and sustainability. The fact that 
when missionaries impacted society then, you knew that this wasn't a flash in the pan. You knew that they were there to stay and that it would be a sustained effort until the right level of impact was made. How do you, as Elevation Church, intend to get there? And therefore, this collaboration you talked about, you know, I mean, how are men of God in the terrain today, you know, how are we going to get this aggregation of resources and effort that will indeed generate the kind of impact and sustainability we need and quality? Well, thank you. So uh, I think it starts with uh, being open to relating with people, relating with other churches, relating, you know, across board, um, relating with even people who may, who may not be like you exactly, like uh, being open, for instance, for me to sit across the table with a Catholic priest or an Anglican priest, and then we have constructive discussions about people, about our society, uh, not devoid of how we worship and the differences of how we worship and how we preach. No, this is about our people. This is about the society. I think if we have more of that, uh, we will be able to do things in a more sustainable way. From what you said, there are denominations that have mastered some of the things that we really want to do. And especially in the Pentecostal circle, uh, we are still in the in, in infancy uh, when it comes to uh, nation building, uh, developing infrastructure and all that. Uh, whilst you, when, you, when you talk about uh, the Baptist, uh, the Methodist church, the Anglican church, the Catholic church, they've done that for, for centuries, literally speaking, you know. So that collaboration is what is needful. But what you realize is that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a Pentecostal, but sometimes I'll tell you that we can be a bit arrogant. Yeah, uh, in, in, in just like thinking that we, maybe we're more spiritual than, than all these other people. And it just doesn't help because when you, uh, if somebody is dying, it's not about uh, whether you're more spiritual or what, we need a solution. That's what we need. And if we have a nation in our hands, that is almost comatose or, or people that are suffering, we need to just come together to be able to do things. So uh, to, to just wrap this up, the, the, to your to the first part of your question, we need to build institutions and stay with them uh, and make it a long game and not just a flash in the pan. I only refer to some of those things as palliatives, as things that we do yeah. off and on, you know, just to uh, just to rebuild the broken walls. But to build from the scratch is always the the you know the assignment of the church, especially in in the third world where those things don't even exist at all. Because even in the developed countries, developed world, built on Judeo-Christian principles and built on, uh, they, they were built on Judeo-Christian principles, but apart from that, the, the educational and health infrastructure that has been built upon as the economy improved, started with some effort from the church. The, one of the foremost academic institutions in the UK is, is the Oxford University. And we all know it has uh, the Christian faith in its background, in, in the starting out. And that's what, what you see around the world. So we just need to be able to get back into that and build more schools, build more hospitals and put uh, you know, the money where it's supposed to be and not just to fund uh, the, the, the flamboyant life of the pastors. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. The last question will go to Pastor Ago and um, I'm gonna put you on the spot because you probably have three minutes for this and it's, it's two questions. Um, one is tied to what Pastor Godman just um, answered, but more directly, somebody has asked, you know, it says, how do we break down the walls? <laughs> you know, so the second question I'd like to also raise is policy advocacy. Another person asks, should the church be involved in policy advocacy? I mean, I, I think of names currently in London, you know, running, I think, for mayor. Um, I, I think for so, Martin Luther King. So, and the, sorry, can you, can you back up? You, you cut off for a bit. Wait, okay, the first one was second. breaking down the walls, and, and yes, the second yes. one is policy advocacy. You know, how can the church leaders get involved in advocating policy? And I was just saying that, there are, you know, two examples come to mind. I know in London currently, you know, you have a Nigerian pastor who is running, uh, I think, for, for mayor. Um, in America, we had the civil rights movement that clearly was a policy issue driven by Martin Luther King. Um, but how do you see that playing out in a place like 
Nigeria and three minutes, please. Okay, um, let, let's take the second one very quickly. Um, you, 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 you get involved in policy because the people feel that you are a player. If they don't feel you're a player, they are not going to call you. They, you will hear when it's being voted on, and that will be the end of it. So we have to make ourselves players. We have to let the people know we have the numbers. We can make a difference at the elections. And so it is in your interest to start to talk to us. We don't want to hear about it when it's on the floor of the House of Reps or the Senate. No, we want to be involved in the policy process. And then we've got to train those who can get involved in that policy process um, so that we start where the, where the policies are being formulated before mm -hmm. they get to the point where they are being voted on, which mm -hmm. is usually where the church gets involved and then we start to mm -hmm. carry placards and we start to run all over the place. Mm -hmm. But by that time, it's a, it's a bit too late um, right. most times because you didn't get involved with, uh, where it started. But I feel right. that the church should play a part in policy. Um, you know, we, in, in the UK, we, we, we play a significant part in certain policies. Um, certainly to do with race, where we, we, you know, we, make our, we make ourselves known. Um, some of the people, the other ad advocates, don't like some of what we're doing, and then it, it plays out itself on social media with all the stuff. But that's a good, that's a sign that we're involved in that policy process. Um, with breaking down the walls. 30 seconds. I, 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 I advocate for breaking down the walls, not to look at structures, but for each of us to take a responsibility. So if every member of the church reaches out to some other part of the church that is not like them, together we will make significant process. So stop waiting for the vicars and the pastors and the priests. Why don't you do something by reaching out and having fellowship with somebody who doesn't worship with your style um, and then see how that builds up? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you very much. I mean, I'll end with one word. What I've heard is relevance. The church needs to build true relevance. So on that note, we'll uh, pass the button back to Obina. Thank you so very much to our dear panelists. Uh, we appreciate the wisdom that you brought to this entire discussion, and we're truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you, much. Uwa. Thank you, Thank, Thank you, you, Pastor Agu. Thank you, Pastor Godman. Thank you, Pastor Obi. Wow. 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 Bravo. Bravo. What can I say? It's been an awesome experience. Uh, Pastor Godman, still leave your camera on. It would be nice to see your very erudite face. I've been known you for several years in this staff. Also. <laughs> so it's nice to see you doing an awesome job with the Elevation Church team. Um, Pastor Aguiruku, awesome job. Discipleship is key and lifelong discipleship for all of us will definitely produce one big family of everyone seeking to create and add value without boundaries. I totally agree. Um, the end point of the story you told, uh, maybe you would um, give Moa Budu a run for her money for script writing. <laughs> the end point of the story you told was that Joshua also left the valley to come and sustain the hands of Moses. Yes, the Moseses should be raising arms on the mountain. They also need the support um, of Joshua's. I believe that is true, that I took out of the chat's room. But I I'm very excited. My sister, Obi Pax Harry, 80 million Nigerians are Christians. Awesome statistics, I agree with you. In a state like Taraba State, there's this puzzle over, is it 50% Adama or is it 50, 60? But just to say, how do we begin the process of shepherding? It's not Christians by name. The church leaders need to understand the principle of expertise. Everyone doesn't need to set up and run a school. We can't be a reactionary people as the church. You are meant to build the people to take their places in the society, not buildings, not buildings. Pastor Aguiruku, you reiterated it saying, speaking on collaboration, you said, what is 100,000 capacity compared to 208 million population. And that was you responding to what Godman Akinlabi kept saying, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. The church needs to play a stronger role in reorientation, changing mindset. I am not surprised coming from the summer day in school of thought, 70 million role models. 
I love the Big Brother initiative by members of the Maryland campus, Pastor Godman. The Elevation Church did something there. A thousand good intentions are not as good as one action. So that's one good point we should celebrate. So let's say that 25% um, performance increase above the previous year is something we should celebrate. Not everything about Nigeria is negative. This is one bright spot we should spotlight and go viral with that news. So I'm going viral on Twitter with it right now. I hope you guys are ready. <laughs> Human capital development, Godman, I can love it. There is need for a lot of collaboration to achieve this, I agree. The culture of the church flaunting affluence needs to change. We pray to have a student loan scheme in Nigeria someday soon. Now I'm not saying people didn't listen. I'm just hoping that some of these key points that I picked out, and of course the recording of this video, I believe will go viral on social media and other platforms. It's time for us to be the change you want to see. I want to thank you, Wa Osa Obo. I want to thank you, my brother, Femi Edu. Awesome job you did. You did a better job that I could have done if I was the moderator of this panel. What do you expect? You, my people say a traveler is wiser than a gray head man. Most of you in diaspora have experienced more things than some of those who, some of us who travel, I attended <laughs> those primary schools where they use Yubo to teach you English language, Omeka Community Primary School. So if the Lord has given you this opportunity, my people say when they call you high scent, you're not supposed to rob local permit. Once more, please go and shine. Thank you very much. God bless you. <laughs> At this point, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> I celebrate you. <laughs>